Hi everybody and Happy New Year. Um, thank you very much for joining us this morning on our first digital surgery webinar of 2021, um, where we'll be focusing on how to generate positive brand awareness using case studies and influencers. To give you a quick introduction, Digital Surgery is a new platform and Knowledge Hub set up for sharing unique insights from thought leaders and experts. And our mission is to teach and provide marketing professionals with practical knowledge and expertise in the morning that you can start doing this afternoon. Uh, my name is Lisa and I'm an account manager at Celeste. As you all know, today's webinar is going to be about case studies, and we are joined by Amanda Bunn, who is PR Account Director at Luminous PR. Um, give us a wave, Amanda. <laughs> and we've also joined by Helen Sharp, who is Account Director at OST Marketing. Give us a wave, Helen. Hello. Um, if you have any questions throughout the talk, uh, please pop them in the Q&A tab. And if you could also say whether it's Amanda or Helen that the question's for, that would be really useful. Um, and we'll answer these at the end. Um, both of our presenters will chat for about 15 minutes each, and we will share the presentations with you afterwards, including any relevant notes. Uh, so just before we get started, we'd love to take a quick screenshot of everyone that has joined us today for social. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind turning on your camera um, and giving us a quick wave, that would be amazing. Um, if you bear with me, I'm just going to go back to Zoom so I can see you all. Uh, so, yeah, anyone that wants to be in the social picture, give us a wave. Hi. Great. Thank you very much for that. And um, sorry, I'm just taking a screenshot. There we go. Um, and um, Thank you very much. So to kick things off, I'm pleased to introduce you firstly to Amanda Bunn from Luminous PR to define what case studies are, how to use them effectively in your business through PR activity. Um, thanks, Amanda. I'll hand over to you. Lovely. Thank you. So I'll just share my screen. So hopefully you can now all see the first slide. Is that OK? OK. So thank you, Lisa, and thank you for having me and thank you, everybody, for, for coming. Um, so this presentation will hopefully um, provide you with some insight into what is needed to build a case study and how you can maximise um, their impact on your business. Um, I'll also touch on a little bit, PR is my you know, forte, um, so I'll just touch on them a little bit as to how they can be used as part of PR, um, PR activity. Um, I always say um, I always have to try and explain what PR is I feel like the Chandler Bing of my friends group like no one still understands what I do so hopefully you'll understand a little bit more about what PR is as well um, before I get started I would like to apologize about a my background I am renovating a house so apologies for the odd colors and plaster and all sorts and I'm not an alcoholic this is just kind of where the wine stash is kept so apologies for that um, so I thought we'd just start off with the basics. So what is a case study? Um, so from a business sense, I believe that pers uh, case studies are self-contained stories about how a real customer overcame their challenges using your products or services. It's just like a story. Good case studies have a beginning, they have a middle and they have an end. Um, and in the, in the case study, the leading character, which generally is your customer, will be able to demonstrate overcoming a problem and achieving their objectives. Um, so I had, I've done a bit of research on putting this presentation together. Um, and from a marketing perspective, it's very clear that case studies work and need to be included within your marketing plan. 73% of B2B marketers um, publish case studies, which is pretty good, it's pretty high. Um, they are the top three content marketing um, tactics after blogging and social media content. And they are the most effective form of content marketing. Um, these are according to three different um, platforms. Um, last week, I um, asked my link, sorry, if you see me looking up there, it's because I've got another screen up there, which is where my slide is. Sorry, it's not, I'm looking for the gods to give me <laughs> the answers or anything. Um, so last week, I posted a LinkedIn poll to my network um, as I was keen to see uh, where the resource is being applied to creating case studies. Um, I don't think the results provide any kind of hidden surprises, um, but I hope this presentation will kind of encourage you as businesses to understand the importance of them um, and why resource should be applied. Um, even if it's an additional 10%, I really hope that you guys kind of 
realise that time needs to be applied to these. Um, two of my contacts also provided a couple of really interesting comments. Um, Hayley Mace, I don't know if anyone um, knows of her here, she's from Anglia um, Local Enterprise Partnership. She um, that kindly provided a statement which said that actually um, Anglia LEP have done more in 2020 than ever before. And this was partly because they had additional budget, um, which they actually applied to a freelancer. Um, and on many occasions, I've actually done this with different organisations that I've worked for and for different clients. Um, and they do, you know, freelancers can work really well. It's a really good um, way to use a freelancer. Um, and then Claire, who I worked with in a previous role um, at another agency, um, she provided a really nice statement about why case studies are so valuable. Um, she made a comment which was, I find they're most effective when the piece ends with a, excuse me, a specific call to action, e.g. Would, you, would your brand benefit from X service, you know, get in touch. So a call to action is really, really important. So looking at the benefits, um, let's start with building trust in your brand. So case studies are extremely effective in building trust because of the very fact that they re represent the viewpoint of your previous customers. Instead of you telling your audience how great your brand is and how effective your products or services are, you're having your customers actually do it for you. Not only do audiences trust other consumers more than they trust companies, but by allowing your previous customers to tell their stories, they are basically endorsing your brand, which gives your business more credibility and trust. They do tell a story. So as I mentioned earlier, simply having customers tell the audience that your product is great is just like a basic customer testimonial. That's not interesting, nor is it very engaging. Case studies are more concerned with telling the story of the customer. The customer is the hero, their problem is the conflict, and your brand solution is the resolution. Um, case studies build an army of brand ambassadors. So those that are willing to share their story about you are your brand ambassadors. They are offering to tell their story because they believe in you and your brand. Knowing who your brand ambassadors are is extremely helpful because they can improve your brand reputation through word of mouth marketing. So that's really a good point to consider. Um, one of the most obvious benefits of using case studies is that they represent the view of your customers and clients, not your company. So blog posts, webinars, all other marketing activities come directly from your marketing team, can often be viewed as self-serving, meaning that people tend to be slightly more skeptical. Case studies come from the mouth of the consumers, so they act as a third party endorsement. Um, you can create a resource for sales. So later on in this presentation, I'll show you how Luminous has used a really good case study as part of a sales deck, um, but they are very helpful when sales members are dealing with prospects and actually thinking about, you know, particular customers that your sales team are talking about, uh, talking to, sorry, and actually identifying specific case studies that meet their requirements. Um, they give evidence. There is no point trying to persuade a customer to buy from you when you give them no evidence whatsoever to back up your claim. So case studies are really good at doing this. Um, SEO. So case studies placed on your website are a great way to boost your SEO ranking. The storytelling nature makes it very easy to intertwine keywords that are related to your product and they will make your website rank higher in Google searches that contain some of the keywords. So when you do put them onto your website, make sure that you are constantly updating them and adding new content so that your case studies page will maintain your ranking. They can be used in a variety of ways and I'll talk about that later in the presentation. Um, it's very important to remember that a case study just isn't a blog post that sits on your website. They are a great way to have longevity and can be used in so many ways. Um, they boost morale externally and internally. So work, working in PR, obviously my objective for the majority of my clients is to get coverage and using case studies and getting coverage for them and then seeing people that I've worked with post on LinkedIn and actually, you know, it's a great sort of boost in morale for them. So it's really nice to see um, that they can work like that. Um, and lastly, they're cost effective. Admittedly, they take time, um, but because of how many ways they can be used, creating a case study is a really cost effective marketing tool for businesses. There's always a constraint um, with anything that we do, but there is um, the one constraint with case studies is they take time. They can take weeks, months, even a year to develop. Um, and it's not only your time, it's time that it takes the customer to um, work with you on them. So just 
consider that time, plan that time effectively. Um, and don't forget to leave time to continually update it later once you've got it live. So this part of the presentation will look at how you can create them. I've tried to break it down in kind of a really simple way on how people can um, generate case studies for their businesses. So the first things first is deciding what objective is it you want to show. Um, I've said here, you know, in other words, what has your client achieved by using your product or service? Is it that the client increased profit or revenue? Is it that they expanded into a new market? Is it that it won awards? My advice here is if you are looking to invest time and resource into creating case studies, why not create like a 12 month planner? And then basically if your aim is to get one case study, uh, sorry, case study a month, make sure that you're kind of fulfilling a whole mix of different case studies that show off different objectives. Then it's looking at choosing the right candidate. So I've made the assumption that you have achieved, because you've achieved excellent results, it means that your relationship with the customer will be one where they are approachable, I hope. Um, so here is a tick box on how to select the right customer to showcase. So um, make sure that they've got obviously exceptional results to, to show. Um, revenue increased by a, a high percentage is a great one. Um, and I also say, especially unexpected success. So we worked with a client um, when lockdown one finished, they were a social media distancing app that people could use at work. National Railway, uh, National Rail, National Rail were the case study. Um, and actually, what, when I mean unexpected success, I mean, not only did people or could people return to National Rail to sort of, um, socially distanced at work, but actually when they did an internal survey, they actually identified that the their employees felt much more confident going returning to work, knowing that this app was helping them kind of remain socially distanced and safe at work. That was a bit of a ramble, sorry about that. Um, recognize, recognizable brands. This is not to say brands or people that are not well known will not be worthwhile, but obviously, you know, if you're working with the likes of Norris City Football Club or you're working with the likes of Adnams, that's going to get a little bit more traction than somebody that you've never heard of. But, you know, people have to start somewhere. So don't ignore um, people and brands that are not um, recognisable. Um, Renal, Rema, excuse me, remarkable, I can't get tongue tied, remarkable knowledge about the brand. So what, what I mean about this is the candidate knows about your brand and your business, your objectives, what you're all about and your people. Make sure it's an interesting story. Um, sometimes we can get a bit consumed and just a bit too absorbed by what we're trying to tell and sometimes it's not very interesting so make sure that you speak to a couple of people just to make sure that it's of interest to to others um images so i would highly recommend if you're going to work with somebody and it's potentially going to be a case study that you look at getting professional images maybe before middle and end um you know nine it's great to have these images to use on websites social media and stuff like that ask yourself is the case study timely is it relevant to now could it be used later is it essential that it needs to be done now um, and if you're planning to use the case study as part of PR, make sure um, that it meets the editorial requirements of the target media um, that you'll be approaching. But I can talk to you about that later. Um, so, uh, third step is um, it's imperative you contact your client for permission to write about them if you're if you're actually doing a case study. Um, so just to help you speed up the process, I'd highly recommend that you either have a call with them or you know email them um, but that you kind of set the stage that uh, for clear and open communication you outline the expectations you give them a really clear timeline and you share the benefits with what to, uh, sorry you share the benefits with the client of why they need to get involved um, the obvious benefits to me are that it's brand awareness profile building um, you know potential backlinks website traffic and so on please remember to get this permission in writing this because they could always turn around and say I never gave it if it was on phone or, or whatever. There are so many ways that you can um, create a case study. There's so many different formats. Um, my advice would be to always do a video interview as well as envisage it being some, um, something that's on your website as a blog post too. More content is better than to, um, more content is better getting now than having to go back to your customer and say, 
oh, can we just do one more thing? Um, because actually you could, you know, push them in the other direction and they'll be like, do you want, just, just forget it. So gathering the crucial information, again, um, typically gathering the, the information will be done via a Q&A or interview. I personally recommend doing the Q&A as a recorded interview, whether that's video or on a, you know, WhatsApp video note or something like that. That way, um, this recording can be edited into snippets for social media posts, video um, snippets and, and so on. Um, before the interview date, always send the Q&A to the customer beforehand so they can prepare accordingly. Um, but do make sure that these questions aren't answers that can just be yes or no. Um, I really would advise that you um, use questions that invite collaboration. And I've listed a few here. Um, and yeah, if you are doing an interview, record it. I think I said that earlier. But um, yeah, just ask them to talk to you through their experience rather than was it a good experience for you? Yes or no answers just isn't going to give you the information. There is no one size fits all when it comes to ways to presenting a case study, even if it is visual. I've listed here and Lisa, am I right? You're sending the presentations over to the attendees after? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's a 10 part tick list here to ensure you have all the information. Um, my advice is that you just break it down into this 10 and then hopefully you've got everything you need um, to ensure that you, know, you haven't forgotten anything. Um, there are so many ways that you can maximise your case studies from videos, blog posts, social media posts, even podcast conversations, PR, leads generation, email marketing, you know, email newsletter. There are so many ways that you can use them. Um, so don't just think it's one, fight, um, one size fits all. Don't just think that oh, I've got blog posts. It's a tick box. You know, make sure your social media teams or you, if you do the social media, are utilising it in as many ways as possible. If you are looking into doing um, using case studies as part of PR activity, here are some do's and don'ts. Um, so if we look at the do's first, do check the publication accepts case studies first. So, so majority of publications do, um, but a lot of them will see them as, as a commercial opportunity and will want to charge, which I appreciate PR you know, is looking for those kind of organic editorial opportunities. Do approach publications one at a time. So I would start with the very top tier, the, you know, the goal of who you want to be with, and then kind of have a list of 10 and maybe work it over a couple of weeks as, as to who you are going to target. Do seek interest from a journalist publication. Ensure that the case study is, re um, is recent. So there's no point going to journalists saying, I worked with this you know, client like 12 months ago, it's not going to be of interest. They want something that's just happened um, so that they can talk through with their readers. Do feature a UK based business. Now, this is obviously relevant to UK media. If you're looking at international, then obviously look at international publications. Ensure it's interesting. Emphasize the results. Have decent images, which goes back to the point of having professional photography and be patient. Journalists are a nightmare and they have turned to me gray um and don't uh don't be unrealistic uh, so don't you know i get so many questions from people like oh i want to be on the bbc i want to be on forbes we all want to be on forbes we all want to be on the bbc but just be realistic um don't be aggressive or sales led don't forget the purpose of the case study um don't use jargon either just because we understand the terminology doesn't mean the journalist will so do you know not right in basic English, I think journalists would kill me for saying that, but just, you know, don't use the kind of slang that we all kind of end up picking up on. Um, don't use the same case study over and over again. You know, pretty much they've got from a PR perspective, a kind of one or two, maybe um, you can get placements for those. Don't upload to your website or share on social before the coverage happens and do not leave a journalist hanging. So if they reply, even if you don't have the answers and you're checking it out, let them know what you're doing. So don't leave them hanging. I've made them out to be quite scary there. They're not as scary as I've just made out, so don't worry. Um, I just thought I'd give you um, last part of the presentation, an example of a really positive case study and something that I'm extremely proud of. Um, I had the pleasure of working on this for one of my clients. This case study on the BBC took us three months to achieve. So this is like, this is why I'm saying be patient. Um, and actually this one piece of BBC coverage got more than 60 duplications on other websites as well. So it was really impressive. The likes of Philip Green, who I appreciate probably isn't 
the most liked man at present, but Arcadia Group got in co contact with them. And sadly, bittersweet for us, we actually, um, they got acquired by the European equivalent of ASOS. So actually they suddenly didn't become a startup. They moved on to the next journey, which saw them leave Luminous, but it's a bittersweet uh, case study for us. Um, so here's a quick tip for you. BBC needs case studies. They want case studies. So that's always good to know. Um, so we knew in order to get a piece on the BBC, we had to demonstrate via a case studies. Case studies for this particular client, Meatball, um, were hard. They were a startup, so they had no evidence really of how their, their product worked. And when I talk about their product, it's a piece of technology that online retailers have. So when you come to buy clothes, you could click, it was an integrated app and people could take real, uh, real time images, which would then present a body avatar. So you could fit clothes on that avatar and see how they looked. So they had no real case studies. It's not a brand new piece of technology, um, but what was unique about it is that the images presented a 98.1% accuracy, which a lot of their competitors didn't have. Anyway, the editor's staff, who's a tech editor, wanted this consumer case study, which none of the online stores could provide. So I remembered a conversation I had with my friend, Serica, pictured in the middle. We were playing crazy golf at Eaton Park, socially distanced, of course. And I mentioned that I was working with Meeple, the moment she got home, she messaged me to say she'd downloaded it and had already used it to purchase some stuff. Although she didn't use the avatar, she used um, the body measurements she got from the photo she took. So I just remembered this and I mentioned this to Stav and Stav said, yeah, okay, I'll speak to Serica. And the rest they say is history. So we got this amazing case study on the BBC. Um, and then this is how Luminous sells, uh, uses the case study in their sales deck. So, you know, we predominantly work with startups and this is just a phenomenal case study to show prospective new clients on how we helped. I mean, this doesn't happen in every situation, but how we helped a startup go from launch to acquisition in just one year. Last slide from me and then we're on to Helen. Um, so Jess, yeah, I hope this has been helpful. Um, here are three tips to kind of keep in your mind if you were to do case studies this afternoon. Um, always seek permission from your customer and have it in writing. Do remember that one size does not fit all, um, but there are lots and lots of options available and please keep the case study updated. So maybe put a reminder in your calendar that every three months or so, just check that the results haven't gone up or you know that um, the, the growth hasn't been bigger. I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for listening. I'll Thanks so there. much, Amanda. That was really insightful. Um, so up next, we have Helen Sharp from OST Marketing to discuss how to amplify your brand message through influencer marketing and employee advocacy. Um, over to you, Helen. Oh, Helen, we have you on mute. Sorry. Classic. There just, you are. Te just testing. Yeah. <laughs> Can you see my screen <laughs> all right? Like... <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Brilliant. So I'm going to talk through some influence marketing today with a tiny bit of employee advocacy at the end as well. So I don't know if you guys currently do influence marketing, but hopefully some of this will be pretty straightforward. If there is anything and we run out of time for any reason at the end, please do reach out. I'm um, more than happy to have a chat through further. So let's get started. Oh. So as humans, it's in our DNA to seek reassurance from others. We do it all the time in everyday life. We probably don't even realize we're doing it. Um, it could be browsing online, reading reviews, reading other people's comments on social posts. And we kind of end up down this rabbit hole where we can't really get out of it because we're just so consumed in all of this information that we're reading. Um, a study has shown that 90% of consumers say that positive online reviews influence their buying decision. So that's huge. So, and it kind of fits nicely with Amanda's case study um, information because we're constantly looking for that reassurance. Um, I'm actually going to admit something as a marketer, I probably shouldn't admit, but I'm a marketer's dream because I always am influenced by things I see online. So if it's, I'll give you an example, actually last night I ordered, <laughs> I shouldn't even admit this, I ordered a beanie hat with a hole in the top to put your ponytail through. Only because I'd seen loads of reviews of people being like, this is amazing, it's a game changer. I don't wear hats, but I was influenced, so I bought it. 
so I'll let you know what it's like. Hasn't obviously arrived yet. Um, and the speed in which digital transformation is moving has only accelerated our need for this validation. So, you know, the truth is we're far more likely to listen to our peers than we are from a brand. Um, so right now, I bet each and every one of you has your phone within reach, right? I can see nodding. Yeah, it's because we're so connected. Like we crave more digital content than we've ever craved, whether it's, you know, digital content, 24 seven news, um, on demand shows, whatever it is, it's an addiction, but it's 2021 and that's just the way the world is going. The word of mouth marketing, it's, you know, Amanda said it, it's so valuable. And this is where influence marketing comes in. I love them or hate them. You've probably all heard of them. You're very aware of the things they post, um, but can they help your brand? So, when we as a brand collaborate with someone in a reputable industry, we're placing ourselves automatically higher in someone's minds because we're using their platform to amplify our message. Um, but it has to be done right because of course we're not stupid. So partnerships and collaborations have to be genuine or else we run the risk of ruining brand reputation. Um, you have to really know your influencer and your audience and do your research. So channel your best Sherlock Holmes, really delve deep into the background of the influencer. What are they posting about? Does it marry up with your brand values um, and things that you wanna talk about? So thinking long-term, the most successful influence campaigns are ones that are done long-term rather than you know just every now and again, they post something for your brand. It's far more successful for both the marketers, but also the um, influencers as well. They want to be involved in long term collaborations. It becomes much more of a partnership and less of a transactional relationship. Um, a lot of consumer marketing is is very often exactly that is transactional. Often they'll work with a brand one time and never again. And it's kind of this it's quite a heavy turnover with um, consumers, whereas with B2B, it's all about that nurturing the relationship to get the most out of the partnership. Um, Collaborations can strengthen brand content, but it also offers your influencer something valuable to be talking about. And if you can get them involved in actually inputting into the content, so rather than just asking them to share something, you know, if they're collaborating with you on a white paper or an e-guide or something, you're going to have much more of their buy-in and they're going to be much more invested in talking about that as well. Um, but at the moment, obviously, you know, never before has the market been so saturated with digital content. So it's become much, much harder for brands to cut through all that noise and really stand out. So tapping into specific ready-made audiences is kind of like um, it's kind of like buying furniture that's not flat packed. So you're it's kind of a ready-made audience that is relevant to your brand, but you're able to amplify your message on. So it's you know it can be a match made in heaven, but it's important to find influences that match up with your. Um, company values so whether that's equality innovation as a society we're more ethically conscious than ever before and we really care about topics like sustainability and diversity they've never been so prominent and so important and brands are realizing now that they have to keep up and they have to be topical and relevant but they also have to care like they have to 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 get the kind of you know the input they need from people they have to resonate with them and I think being ethically conscious is a massive massive it's a new direction for a lot of companies but it's one that more and more are taking and we're seeing that more than ever at the moment um we're seeing that brands are increasing their CSR activity so again how can you use influencers to really kind of position yourselves and talk about all the great stuff you're doing because some brands are doing phenomenal things and if they can tap into an influencer's audience where it's relevant automatically they're reaching a whole new audience. So we work really company, um, really closely with a company called Onalytica. Um, and there's a quote on the screen from the CEO, Tim Williams. They specialize in influencer marketing solutions and they recently released a report, I think it was towards the end of last year on B2B influencer marketing. Um, it's really, really good. And I recommend you download it. Um, I can put the, the link into the chat after this as well. Um, it's full of insightful um, things, it's got loads of stats in there. And I'm gonna break down the different types of influencers we get, but Tim's message is all around kind of aligning 
what you're looking for as a brand, but also marrying up with the right influencers because it can really be so valuable when you get the right people. We've got different types of influencers. You might know the different types, but I'm just going to break it down um, in terms of B2B, a bit of consumer um, as well. So whether you work in B2B or consumer, hopefully some of these might fit with, with your um, what you're looking for. First up, you've got your industry experts. So really looking at B2B here, top of their game. These are your keynote speakers, the ones um, that will provide thought leadership and consulting. They'll help you manage brand perception and they'll demo your products. They'll help with product launches. Um, really, really kind of respected in their industry. People hang on every word they say. Then you've got your consumer influencers. So the ones you see on Instagram, um, flogging products half the time, but they are quite often used for product sales um, where the end goal is to sell a product. Um, and we can break these down further into um, nano, micro, macro, but don't always be seduced by big numbers. That's one thing that a lot of brands, and you know, I've worked with brands before where they only want to work with um, influencers that have over 500,000 followers. And often they don't have the budget to go with that. But some of my best work that I've done, um, so I previously worked um, at Interflora and we worked with numerous um, influencers on various campaigns. Best results I ever got was working with the micro influencers. So the ones that have kind of less than 50,000 followers, they're the ones that are looking for content. They're hungry for content with brands. They, they don't require payment most of the time um, we would just give them kind of a bouquet and they you know they post up these lovely pictures we get great content they're the ones that nurture their communities as well and um, so they spend a lot more time talking to their communities um, than you'd get with perhaps the bigger ones um, and also if you think about millennials as well so if your target audience is millennials using influence is a great way to communicate because they kind of look like they look at influencers more like they're their friends um, and they identify them in they identify with them in a way that they can't necessarily with celebrities, for example, the likes of Kim Kardashian. So we've all seen macro influencers. We've all got our opinions on them. Um, they're the ones that, you, you know, every other post they do is hashtag ad and we're turned off by these. We don't interact with them and you don't look at this picture of. Kimmy K and think oh yeah her new obsession is really that gummy bear that makes her hair so shiny you're thinking about all of the stylists she has working on her weave that the gummy bear she's not even tasted a gummy bear she's probably just posed with it then so you know a lot of us wouldn't even interact with that because we just think oh it's another ad but there are some people that do and that's when influencer marketing can be quite dangerous um because some people are influenced by that kind of thing and they do hang on every word they say um and you know, influence marketing, when it's in the wrong hands, if we look at Donald Trump, that's when, you know, that's the wrong kind of influence. So just being very mindful of what's right for your brand. Um, and then you've got the industry experts who join webinars and podcasts to chat about their topic of interest. Um, so this is much more kind of a long term. Um, you think about the long term with this because you're thinking about all the different ways you can reformat content. So like Amanda was saying earlier, don't just think about one platform that you're going to use these things on think about every possibility you can do with this one piece of content because it's likely that you can chop it up and repurpose it across different formats um, at ost we often hold roundtables um, or webinars and we have an expert on and then we record it and then after that we we create e-guides blog posts social posts we then we often translate stuff as well if it's relevant for other regions and um, so it's constantly always thinking about what we can do to make the most of, of that content um, an interesting brief is key for influencers so the study that i mentioned on Lytica did 36 percent of influencers surveyed cited an interesting brief as the most important factor um, when considering working with a brand so it actually came out on top of monetary compensation so when it comes to payment, and this is a question we get asked all the time, yes, some do want paying, um, but usually it's those with the bigger followings. So ones, the brands that we work with, we actually don't pay most of the influencers at all. We might pay them if it's a bigger ask. So if it's a keynote speak, um, you know, if they're doing something like that, yes, they perhaps would want paying. 
but it's really kind of thinking about right what's your budget if you have a budget can you offer them anything um 72 percent of b2b marketing influencers would be willing to work for a brand for free so they are out there you can get some great stuff with them we like I said, we very rarely pay influencers. Um, it's just about packaging up the right offering for them. Um, we would need a lot longer today to talk about all the regulations that come with influencers when it comes to paying them and you know what do you need to state. So more than happy to have um, lengthy conversations about this if anyone does want to delve in because it's a massive, massive area. But just be aware that if you are working with influencers, if there's any money, um, any compensation or gifting, or if you have any creative control, so whether you're asking them to write something and you'll approve it first, anything like that, you have to declare it as a sponsored ad, um, a collaboration. So it's, you know, if you're just working with them, and we often do um, influencer lists. So we work with a big fintech company who um, we have a top 100 list of influencers. And we don't pay any of those. We just work with them very closely um, to get some really, really great content. We get them on live streams and it's, you know, it's very much a mutual um, partnership. So you've always got to be thinking what's in it for them because they will ask you what's in it for them. So it's good to be prepared. Um, for a lot of B2B brands, um, possibly up until around March last year, when a little thing called coronavirus came on our radars, um, they... Some of them didn't use social media in a particularly strategic way. A lot of them, it wasn't even on their radar. So we've seen a lot of events shifting online this year, or 2020, 2021. Um, and this is only going to get bigger for 2021. Um, 2020 threw us some massive curveballs. And a lot of businesses are going into this year with learnings of being more creative, um, different ways of getting their message out there, because what they might have done previously has obviously had to adapt, but we're seeing some great things with online um, and social media. So there's no doubt things have changed, but there's lots that still can be done, which is great. So ooh, that concludes the influence a bit. I'm just gonna very quick, I'm just conscious of time, go through um, looking a bit closer to home. So really thinking about what's under your nose. You've got employees, why not make them internal experts really kind of leverage their platforms it's likely that they're connected with audiences that are relevant to yours um so really looking at kind of utilizing that um with algorithm changes and things across the platform brands are constantly looking at ways to get more eyes on their content um so employee advocacy can come in really handy um a lot of employees don't have the confidence to talk about their company online and you know you might be able to relate to this it's kind of a gray area you don't really know what you can say what you can't say so most people actually avoid it completely um things with employee advocacy it has to work two ways so if you're asking your employees to do something it needs to come across genuine to their audience so you don't just want to give them a copy and paste post for example you want to find things that they're also interested in whether it's new product launches or innovations anything like that that they're genuinely interested in and then also kind of explain to them that it's good for their profiles it's good for their um, professional networks as well so really kind of building up their profiles to be able to kind of position themselves as this thought leader um, so you can get really really great content um, from employee advocacy because who better to talk about your business than those at its very core. Um, and that concludes very quick whistle stop of influence marketing with a pinch of employee advocacy. Um, thank you so much. I'll pass you back over to Lisa um, for any questions. Thank you so much, Helen. That was really, really informative. Um, so um, I have had a couple of questions come in while we've been um, uh, listening to our speakers. Um, just trying to get those up on my screen. Um, so a couple of questions for Amanda, um, first of all. Um, so in regards to repurposing a case study with new successes, is it worth creating a brand new case study or are you best to update an old one? Sorry, say that again. So if so if you were repurposing a case study with new successes, um, is it worth creating a brand new case study or would it be better to update the previous one that you'd already published? Oh, that's a good question. Now, um, I personally, depending on how old the old old version was, I mean, if, it, if, the, if the old case study is like two years old, I'd look at creating another one. But if it's that you're looking at 
similar results, but it's just a lot, lot better, then yeah, I'd update the old one. Does that make sense? So if it's if the old case study is really old and the new version of the case study is quite different, then I create a new one. But if it's just that the results are updated like over a two year period, then yeah, just repurpose the old one. Okay, that's great. Um, and leading on from that, um, could case studies be shaped to become award entries? And do you have any tips on awards entries as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they can be case studies. Uh, case studies can be used for award entries. Um, I mean, a lot of awards, you know, are broken down in various ways and require different information. Um, but yeah, always when writing um, a case study, always have it in your mind that this could be an award entry. Okay, that's great. Um, another one for Amanda. Um, due to the nature of our, um, so this is from, sorry, this is from um, Emily Pitcher. Um, Emily's asking, due to the nature of her business, um, their case studies have to be anonymous and can't take images. So are these as effective and still worth doing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Emily, I don't, I, maybe it's a conversation to have after this, but I don't know whether you can still use kind of anonymous quotes or and it, as long as you can use the results i think the results is that is the absolute key so what difference did working with your brand your product your business what difference did that make to this business and that's the absolute key so if you can't reference anything publications will still take those types of case studies but it's absolutely proving what you did what's the difference um that's that's the absolute key but more than happy to take that off offline okay um, we've got a question with regards to clients Q and A's. Um, so, um, Amanda, you mentioned that a video recording could be used to present this content in current lockdown times. Would a podcast style recording be sufficient? Um, creation of video from home has varying levels of success. Plus, should we be including transcripts for SEO purposes? Yeah, absolutely. They're all good. Um, SE, you know, transcripts are really, really good. Um, you know, a recording of a Zoom, you know, people at the end of the day, we're all in this situation together. So, you know, no one's going to judge you if you haven't got a studio set up, um, you know, during lockdown. In fact, I think you'd be judged if you had that kind of set up right now. <laughs> so I think, yeah, you know, absolutely um podcast style even a zoom chat you know as long as you can take sort of snippets from it um that's absolutely fine and you know you don't have to use the video after it just gives you a great way to listen back in make sure you've got that essential information that you need thank you um i've got a couple of questions for helen as well um so any good examples of a b2b influencer campaign that has worked really well yeah, so um, I kind of alluded to the fintech one. So we work with a brand called Refinitiv um, and we have a list of 100 influencers that we worked with on Litica, the software company that I mentioned, um, to identify in their key um, topics. So what we would then do is we'd last year, for example, last January, we had um, like an influencer breakfast event in New York and we had about 10 of the influencers come to that and we had um, some senior stakeholders in Refinitiv and it was a round table discussion. It was super informal, but we got some really great conversation going. And from that, we then, you know, we encourage people to post about it. And then after that, it's kind of going to that cascade, um, cascade um, example that I shared earlier, where you really kind of think, what else can we do with that content? So we created blog posts, we had follow up conversations with influencers, they all shared across their um, their social channels and I think we reached something like 32 million people within the first few weeks of launch of this new list and um, just from doing all these different activities so it's really kind of thinking about loads of different formats of content that you can do um, so yeah that that's a an example I can share um, we also work with Salesforce do some really great influence stuff we recently did a um, gratitude campaign which um, my team at OST worked on and had some really lovely because when you kind of take them away from just talking about your products and services and you tap into company values, um, you get some really lovely, genuine content. So it's not always about getting influencers to push your products and services. It's kind of thinking about, well, actually, they share similar values when it comes to um, diversity or innovation. And it's really kind of tapping into that area. So it's not too salesy and it's you get some really, really lovely results when you do that. That's great. That sounds really good. Um, and um, what would be the definition of a nano influencer? Because you touched briefly on macro, micro and nano. Just wondering yes. what the kind of metrics are for those. 
Yeah, so metrics, wherever you look across the board, they'll all be different. Nano, I say, is anything less than 10,000. Um, so don't dismiss nano influencers because they're the up and coming influencers. You know, if you can establish a good brand relationship with them, they're looking for content. They're very keen. They're the ones that nurture their communities along with the micro, which I'd say is less than kind of 50,000. Um, they're really looking for stuff to kind of talk to their audience about and position themselves as kind of an expert in that area, I guess. Okay, that's great. Um, we've got a question from um, Sabrina um, saying that she's writing case studies every month about new members with the same questions and it's getting a bit repetitive because um, it's the same industry. Any advice on how to make case studies more interesting? Yeah, so Sabrina, I guess it would be good to understand like what you're doing with the case study. So uh, is it just that it's for a blog post? Is it worth looking at how it, I guess it's looking at how the question or the questions that you're currently asking, um, whether it's, you know, you're missing anything, I'm more than happy to have a look at the questions if you want to send them to me afterwards and I could maybe have a little look and see if there's, you know, anything that we can add or, or take away or whatever, but just be good to understand the format of the case study, I guess, every month, because it could be that you could mix it up with different formats every month. So you have one for social media, then you have one for a blog post or, or something like that. Um, and yeah, I'm more than happy to take a look at the questions. There are ways, of course, that you can ramp it up. Excellent. Um, any other questions from anyone else before we wrap things up? Um, obviously, if anybody um, wants to ask any questions that they think of, you know, after we finish today, um, you know, please feel free to send us through an email and we'll do our best to get those answered for you. But does anyone have anything they'd like to bring up now? No, looks like everyone's asked what they wanted to ask for now. So that's great. Um, so uh, thank you all so much for attending. Um, like I said, if you do think of any additional questions, uh, please feel free to pop us an email and we'll happily answer them for you. Uh, just to let you know, after the webinar, you will receive an email from us with a small feedback survey. Um, so it'd be great if you could take um, a short amount of time to fill that out. That'd be really helpful. Um, we'll also be sending you our next event details and the presentation slides from today. Um, for future events, if you have any ideas of brands, marketing techniques or speakers, uh, please do let us know. And lastly, please do head over to LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter to give us a follow at Digital Surgery to keep up to dates with everything. Um, so all that remains is for me to um, say thank you very much again to Amanda and Helen. Um, really great presentations, guys. Really, really um, interesting. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.